There's a lot of anger about Israel's bombing campaign in Gaza. Those far from the fighting are using their wallets to show their discontent. But does boycotting Israeli goods and companies really have an impact? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Now, consumers are increasingly clued up on where what they're buying comes from and which side certain companies are on. Calls to boycott some of the globe's biggest restaurant chains have cost millions. But is the movement sending the right message? Let me turn to the customer service desk. We've got some Israeli products that we're returning to you and we're going to ask you not to reshell them. These activists are clearing supermarket shelves of Israeli products. Elsewhere, student unions and local government councils are refusing to deal with companies profiting from occupied Palestinian land. And there are growing calls for Israel to be banned from the Eurovision Song Contest. The Palestinian-led International Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, or BDS, movement says it aims to isolate Israel until it complies with international law and recognizes the rights of Palestinians. As the bombardment of Gaza continues, the calls for a boycott are getting louder. This state that practices ethnic cleansing and genocide against our people, they must be boycotted and sanctions should be imposed on them in all forms. Boycotting is a message to resist the occupation. Many communities around the world are embracing that message. Israel is engaging in war crimes in Gaza right now and we can't have British investors pouring money into a state that's engaged in apartheid and atrocities. But as public support for the BDS movement grows, some governments are manoeuvring to stop it in its tracks. We stand with Israel now and forever. The UK government has pushed forward with a bill banning public bodies, including local councils and universities, from boycotting Israeli goods forcing them into line with government foreign policy. Similar laws already exist in 38 US states. Well, there is a, an impatience with protest, a desire for them to just shut up, I think. And also, sadly, there are leading figures in government and think tanks that advise government that are actually antagonistic to the exercise of civil liberties outside parliament. Back at the supermarkets, activists are focusing on Israeli dates grown on illegally occupied Palestinian land. It's a market worth hundreds of millions of dollars to Israel in exports every year, and the BDS movement is determined to shut it down this Ramadan. Well, let's meet our guests. Joining us from London, Ben Jamal, director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign in Liverpool in the United Kingdom. Aisha Ijaz, she is lecturer in marketing at Edge Hill University. In Kuala Lumpur, Maud Nazari bin Ishmael, he's professor at the Department of Management and Marketing at the University of Malaya and chairperson of BDS Malaysia. And also in London is Safana Monajed, who's a marketing strategist. Ben, I'll come to you first. I've noticed a lot of various different videos on social media recently. In Ireland, for example, people removing products from supermarket shelves. Does this make a difference or do the supermarkets just put them back when the activists leave? Um, yeah, uh, good afternoon. I mean, yeah, listen, the, I mean, people in doing that and uh, what we're seeing at the moment, I think is a real upsurge in all forms of solidarity for the Palestinian people uh, in response to what people are seeing in terms of the unfolding genocide in Gaza. And part of that, and rightly, people, when they're looking to answer the question, what can I do, uh, are going back to the fundamentals of the message that Palestinian civil society gave us as far back as 2005, uh, where it called for a global campaign of boycott, divestment and sanctions until Israel ends its violations of international law and, and Palestinian rights. And what we're seeing at the moment is people both engaging in strategic campaigns focused on uh, core BDS targets. We have campaigns, for example, running uh, against Barclays Bank, which is a complicit bank because it provides 
uh, financial infrastructure for companies that are arming Israel. But pe people are also focused on going to their local supermarket, looking at the goods that are from Israel um, and making uh, decisions not to purchase those goods. And these things we know historically do have impacts. I mean, the BDS movement takes part of its lead from tactically from what proved successful in addressing South African apartheid. And part of what brought that regime to an end was the global campaign for boycott, divestment uh, and sanctions in the 70s and 1980s. Safana, can I ask you, the past six months, how have you noticed the growth in people's awareness of the BDS movement? It's been steady um, and at times it, it peaks, especially when we talk about the these larger brands, right? But um, I think specifically what we're seeing in smaller hubs of startups is those who have a little bit more agency are able to uh, lean into being on the right side of history, which is what most people are realizing that they should be doing at this moment in time, right? And then that's where we see the slight upsurgence where people who own companies, who are leaders within their brands or whatever it might be, have that specific place of influence. So they create this net of safety where people aren't afraid to put their money where their mouth is, so to speak, right? And really partake in um, supporting the people of Palestine in the way that they keep telling us is the way to keep doing it, right? Um, and I think what we keep seeing really and truly is that these work and a place like Israel wouldn't have a ministry against BDS and wouldn't put all of their money in to, or so much of money into figuring out how to go against these tactics if they weren't so powerful. And I think the moment people realize just how powerful these tactics are is the moment they start engaging in something like boycotting Barclays or changing where you get your coffee from, et cetera. So it's a, it's a steady incline and we can only hope that it grows exponentially. Nazari in Malaysia, you've been very successful in terms of targeting one particular fast food chain, McDonald's. They issued BDS Malaysia with a lawsuit subsequently withdrawn. Just talk us through how the last few months have been for you. Well, firstly, as you know, um, McDonald is not the main target of the BDS movement. Uh, it is uh, it's categorized as organic boycott targets, not initiated by us, as started by the ordinary people, by the public, and then we recognize it. And as you know, it's because of, uh, mainly because of uh, uh, what happened when, because of the action of B McDonald in Israel to give free foods to the Israeli military. And um, what happened was the, the public in Malaysia was, were very upset and they, the boycott increased tremendously. And McDonald, I think uh, in Malaysia, um, decided that they want to uh, intimidate people, uh, intimidate influencers, etc., and and decided to, to sue us. Uh, of course, the, the, the legal basis is very weak because uh, we didn't actually defame them. And, uh, but they decided to sue us anyway. But halfway uh, recently, uh, they asked for a mediation meeting. They wanted to talk to us and convince us uh, to withdraw the McDonald logo from the poster. And uh, we had a, a meeting organized by the Malaysian uh, court. And we said to them that we can consider that, provided that you condemn Israeli crimes of genocide and apartheid in Palestine. You make it clear that uh, you condemn what is happening over there, uh, the killings over there. But unfortunately, uh, they, they didn't want to issue the statement. They didn't want, they want, they said they can condemn genocide, but they were not willing to condemn Israeli involvement in the genocide. So we said that's not good enough. We said that if you refuse to mention uh, the, uh, the action, the genocide is actually uh, done by the Israeli, by the Israelis. Then it's not good enough for us. And uh, we decided to go for a second mediation meeting in order to to uh, to come to an agreement. But out of the blue, uh, before the second mediation took place, they decided to withdraw uh, their lawsuit. We were actually quite willing to go to the court because we know that we are 
in a very strong position. But uh, when they withdrew, so uh, we, uh, it's obviously it's obvious that they they knew that they were not going to win, and it, their action of swing us was actually backfiring, making people more upset at them. And I think that's the reason why they withdrew. Unlikely, they will not get the the market back. I think I think the consumers will be more angry at them. So I think they are in a very difficult situation. The source of the problem, uh, are actually, the source of the problem is actually the authorities in Palestine. As long as the authorities continue over there, I don't think um, uh, that their problem will be resolved unless they terminate their agreement with the franchisee in Israel. That may, I think, probably uh, solve their problem a bit. Let's bring in Aisha. Aisha, from a marketing perspective, the Gaza conflict has turned into a nightmare for many big corporations, hasn't it? Because the public are seeing what's happening and they're shopping accordingly. Yes, I absolutely agree. Um, in, in the context of buying behavior, it's often very difficult to impact long-term in terms of how consumers purchase and buy, but that usually depends on how salient or how, let's say, urgent or relevant the issue is to the consumer themselves. But what we see here is how, let's say, the internet and social media has almost made the issue a lot more global. And so for brands themselves, they ought to see where their customer segments lie. They need to understand the demographics. And what made it so difficult in the issue when it came to McDonald's is that they do have franchises in many international uh, countries where the consumer base is largely, I guess, Muslim. And so in that case, it didn't work in their favor. Um, but we often see that if there is, I guess, political harmony between the customer base and the organization, let's say in the case of um, Nike and the Black Lives Matter, um, most of Nike, Nike's uh, consumer base are liberals in that sense. So they often, are maybe, um, you know, when the boycotts occur, they don't tend to be, they, they tend to lead to boycotts where they have a larger liberal consumer base who support those um, main commonalities in terms of um, making sure there's equality, and etc. So when it comes to the case of, I guess, the boycotting of um, these McDonald's, etc., they ought to really consider who their consumer base are in, a, uh, in order to then understand um, the effects uh, or to have preventative measures put in place that will address if things go wrong. And I think we are erring in the side of where we have social media and there's a lot of, a lot going on about in research about crisis management. And I think these social media platforms have brought in a whole new dynamic to the way people now boycott brands because there's a quicker, a more rapid mobilization of gathering people and sharing experiences online. Um, and that can really, if it's, you know, um, very successful, as we've seen in the case of McDonald's and a few other companies, can, companies can lead to a decrease in sales. Well, talking about sharing experiences online, Aisha, this Ramadan, there is increasing pressure on social media for people not to break their fast with Israeli dates, whether they bought them knowingly or not. Here is just a sample of what some people have been saying online. Dates, these sweet, delicious, nutritious fruits we love to eat during Ramadan. <laughs> but guess what? If you love Medjool Dates, Israel is the world's largest Medjool date exporter, producing more than 70% of all Medjool dates around the globe. Ramadan is upon us, which means Israeli dates will be everywhere during Ramadan. So me and you, okay, and all of us, need to do our research before we buy any dates this Ramadan. We cannot be complicit, okay, in funding these people to commit genocide upon the Palestinian people. A lot of people don't know that 70% of the Majul dates that are sold internationally are actually stolen off Palestinian lands by Israelis and labeled as their own and sold to Muslims to gain a profit. In some cases, these dates are even labeled made in Palestine, but their manufacturers are pro-Israeli, so you need to be careful. Ben, I just want to read some facts to you from Friends of Al-Aqsa. They've put together a hashtag check the label campaign about these dates. Israel is the world's largest producer of medjool dates. 
50% of Israeli dates are exported to Europe, and the main destinations are the UK, Netherlands, France, and Spain. What does it say to you about the success of BDS tactics and strategy that a lot of these dates now are packaged up in a way that the consumer is not really able to see where they're from? Um, well, I mean, we, we, we heard earlier um, a, a reference to the efforts that um, Israel has been making to try and suppress uh, support for BDS. Uh, it has actually, as we heard, um, I think in 2010 set up, maybe 2012 set up uh, an entire ministry, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, whose remit was uh, to take action through various mechanisms, through uh, sort of Hasbara propaganda to try to demonize those who are supporting, but also trying to get friendly allied states to introduce laws to suppress support for BDS. Um, and part of the way Israel does that is its failure uh, to um, comply with, um, in, in some cases where it, there are regulations where it's supposed to properly label goods. We see this particularly in relation to uh, the, the EU introduced regulations uh, that all goods from uh, illegal settlements were supposed to be identified as such. Israel's got various mechanisms where it gets round that and tries to um, create confusion for people in terms of where a product actually comes from. So you're right, that is a, an indication, but with proper information, um, such as you know what you've just referenced in terms of guidance that's available for people on how to check a label, how to try to identify where a product is from, and also you know the provision of information to people about alternatives, people are able to exercise uh, informed uh, informed choices about what they buy. And the issue of dates is always significantly important, uh, obviously, at this time of year, around Ramadan, where, um, you know, um, we know there will be a spike in sales of dates, and we want to encourage people not to purchase dates from companies that are complicit uh, in supporting uh, Israel's oppression of the Palestinian people. Safana, so are we seeing greater awareness from consumers with regards to purchasing dates? You know, I would imagine people from the Muslim community will be very much aware of this issue, perhaps non-Muslims less so. Totally agreed. I think that's bang on. And um, I think what we, so far we've spoken about a couple of really important points. One is that we have to know who we're talking about when we are talking about products. So that's Nike knowing who their target audience is when they took a stance on uh, the Black Lives Matter movement um, and really understanding the kind of tactics that are in place. Um, if you do want to hire an entire ministry to go against BDS movement, of course, we're going to see tactics like confusion. Of course, we're going to see tactics uh, built specifically to confuse a specific target audience. And we're going to see things like intimidation. Right. So I think uh, weirdly, all of these things are backfiring because they've become more and more evident. Um, and where they were evident in the beginning to some um, communities like the Muslim community who see this every year, right? Um, we're now starting to spread awareness. Uh, and social media, of course, uh, is tends to kind of be on the side of um, uh, like the undoing misinformation a lot of the times, right? It, I know it gets bad rep, but <laughs> we know where it gets a bad rep from. Um, and we're now starting to see uh, mainstream media with a slight discernment that we didn't have before. And I think exactly the same is happening with brands and exactly the same is happening with smaller communities um, where they're now starting to tell people the patterns they've been spotting to explain what has been organically happening, which is a larger effort to confuse, to misdirect, because the BDS movement has been so effective in doing what it is trying to do, right? Um, we can only expect their efforts to increase more in trying to confuse us. Um, and we can only hope that we'll ride that or surf that wave um, ahead of them. Nazari, I want to read to you some statistics just about how the boycotts have been impacting some major brands. So McDonald's from October to December, franchises in the Middle East, India and China, they achieved pretty low growth of 0.7%, missing the target of which was 5.5%. Starbucks has lost $11 billion or 9.4% in market value since mid-November amidst a workers' strike and pro-Palestine supporters calling for a boycott of the coffee giant. 
Domino's, the pizza company in Asia, uh, their sales fell by 8.9% in the second half of last year, mainly because of the Malaysian boycott. So those numbers would indicate that whatever you're doing in Malaysia and elsewhere, it's working. I think uh, it's good because it will send a message to companies that if you have a presence in Israel, you are going to be uh, targeted uh, sooner or later. Uh, so if you have a presence and you have a franchisee, for example, over there, the franchisee may, may do something stupid like what uh, the Madonna in Israel did to give free food do some of the things to show or to show to, or to prove their loyalty to the Israeli regime and the world community will boycott them. So the best thing to do for them, and we hope that will be the message that we want to give to them, is you get out of the Israeli market. Then only you will be safe from possible boycott efforts by the public in the future. Aisha, we've got a big summer of sport coming up. Just moving away from consumerism and people's shopping behavioral habits. Do you think, you know, we've got the Olympics, the Paralympics, there's a lot going on. Do you think the boycott movement may be visible even at Eurovision in Sweden in May? There's so much happening in the coming months. Do you think Israel will be boycotted at these big events? I'm hoping so. Um, I think if it does, and it shows the scale of which the bo uh, these boycotts have been reaching. And we have seen slowly, I guess, celebrities Either, not, either they don't speak or they will be saying something positive, whether it's to do with the victims that are involved. So I hope to a certain extent uh, it will do. But often we see in the cases of other boycott movements that's happened where, you know, I guess athletes, etc., have withdrawn. But I guess in this case, um, they often side on the air of caution just because of what the media narrative is in terms of how they associate those that maybe don't take a stand, whether it's anti-Semitism to maybe, you know, it's just the, the, the narrative, the media, I guess, in the Western society has given to those that are maybe against what's going on in Israel. So maybe that would be a factor that they may consider. But I do hope um, that there will be people that be be able to take a stand because that will just show and maybe emphasize this movement and the seriousness of it, to be honest. Ben, can I ask you, as heartbreaking as the past six months have been, the reasons BDS exists, everything we've witnessed on our televisions, reading in our newspapers, on social media, do you feel that BDS will just keep going from strength to strength because so many right-thinking people have been appalled by Israel's actions? Yeah, look, I think what we're um, seeing at the moment uh, in, in terms of the extraordinary waves of solidarity that we're seeing globally um, here in the UK, particularly manifested through uh, the extraordinary demonstrations that we at uh, Palestine Solidarity Campaign have been leading, you know, up to a million people marching on one demonstration, but regularly three to four hundred thousands. We know what this is fueled by. This is fueled by people witnessing um, the live streaming of a genocide across their s screens, and they are horrified by what they're seeing. They're outraged at the response of our political leaders, um, and therefore they are trying um, to, to, to generate their own response through every mechanism of pressure they can employ. Now, we know history tells us, you know, at some point there will be a ceasefire. Um, and we know that some of that support will melt away. But I genuinely believe we are at a moment of seismic change. There is a whole generation of people, I think, who are being politicized at the moment around the issue of Palestine. We are seeing extraordinary numbers of young people. I was struck recently. I spoke at a, an event. Um, um, I was online. I was speaking at an event, a launch of a new PSC branch in a very small town in the south of England. At that meeting, I was told that 100 children from a local high school had marched out of their school into the town centre uh, to protest against the genocide. Some of that you're not going to be able to put back in the box. And part of our message, and all of those who've been campaigning on this issue for years, our task now is to harness that energy and to turn it into long-term sustained campaigning for change. Um, 
our numbers, the people that follow PSC in the UK, was 75,000 before October. Now it's well over 300,000 people who have subscribed, who ask for regular information from us and who are ready to take action. So our task is to harness that into long-term sustained campaigning. And then the fundamental dynamics haven't changed. The message from the Palestinian people as to what can we do to bring about that change uh, is incorporated within the call for BDS. It, it is effectively do what you can in your arena to end the complicity of your government, your public bodies uh, and your companies and corporations in our oppression. Uh, and that's the model, as I said, that comes from South Africa. Israeli apartheid, this current genocide, the decades of military occupation can only be sustained because of the complicit support uh, of companies and of governments across the world. And the BDS campaign addresses that directly and says particularly to companies and corporations, you will be held to account. You will pay a financial penalty if you are complicit in this oppression. So we have to sustain the momentum. We know that the high levels of energy we're seeing at the moment won't sustain themselves at this level, but we know that there are whole generations of people now who are politicized and are going to be motivated to continue to take action. And the pressure is only going to ramp up on Israel. Ben, Nazari, Aisha and Safana, thank you all so much for your insights. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me and Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.